Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard me say this a couple times at this point, but we're glad that you're here. Um, and if you haven't already introduced yourself in the chat box, please do. And thank you to everyone who has. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll now um, and share the result. Can Jay, can you guys see that okay? I can see it. Great. Um, so just so everybody knows, um, this is the uh, Careers in Historic Preservation virtual panel. If this is not where you thought you were supposed to be, please feel free to log off, but otherwise we're glad to have you here. Or stick around. Or stick around, that's true. Yeah, it's interesting no matter what. Um, so it looks like today uh, we do have a fair amount of people who currently work in preservation, construction, and the trades, um, and about an equal number of people who are looking to get into that field. Um, and we do have a board member volunteer as well. Um, the thing that I like to see here is this last one. Um, it looks like everybody, almost everybody, is generally interested in learning about preservation and cultural resources, um, which I think you are in the right place for that. Uh, so a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, I'm sure that everybody is, you know, Zoom pros by this point, but so I'll make it short. Um, all the attendees, you guys are all in listen and watch only mode. Um, but we definitely want to hear from you throughout this webinar and throughout the panel. We encourage you to use the chat feature to participate, which you guys have already tested out and used. Um, and we also encourage you to use the Q&A feature. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little box with um, two chat bubbles. If you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in that Q&A session, uh, Q&A uh, feature, and we'll have time to talk about those questions at the end of the panel. Um, anything that we don't get to, any of those questions that we don't get to live, we will offer the panelists an opportunity to respond to in writing. So please do put things in there, even if you don't think they might be relevant to the rest of the group, we'll still try to get you an answer for your questions. Um, if you are watching on Facebook Live, please feel free to put your questions in the comments there and we'll have someone relay them onto the Zoom webinar. So don't worry, we will hear you there as well. Um, finally, I just want to note that we are recording this panel and we'll email you a link to the recording after we're done. So if you miss anything, don't worry about it. You'll have a chance to watch this again. Or if you just want to look at all of our beautiful faces for another hour, you are more than welcome to do that too. Um, finally, before we go, I do just want to take a moment to thank the sponsors whose support of our education programs make today's panel possible. Uh, that includes the Daily Journal of Commerce, the SETI Architects, Daniels Real Estate, and Ron Wright and Associates. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our moderator, Jay Mortensen, the Washington Trust's Outreach Director. Uh, hi, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I am the Outreach Director to, for the Washington Trust. I'm really happy to welcome our panelists today. Um, after our first uh, panel, we got some great feedback about more. <laughs> Let's do more. So we're, we're excited to have this second one on the books. And um, if we get more suggestions, we'll definitely do more panels. So let us know if you're interested in hearing more about historic preservation. Um, today, as Alex mentioned, we'll be focusing in on uh, preservation trades. So we've assembled an, uh, a great group to speak to that. And I'm just going to uh, introduce them by name, but then give our panelists a chance um, to introduce themselves a little bit uh, as well. So we've got Lindley Logan, the Arts Program Manager um, at uh, for the Northwest Heritage Program at Evergreen State College, Sarah Steen, who's a Landmarks Coordinator for King County, and Steve Stroming, who's the project exec, who is a project executive at uh, RAF and Company. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. This contact information will be available again at the end of the panel if you wanna take a quick screenshot or write it down, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing for now. And then um, to get things started, I'm gonna start with Lindley and I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to basically just give a description of what your job responsibilities are. And if it's not clear from that, how it relates to preservation. But I think most of you are pretty directly related to preservation. So we'll start with Lindley. 
Well, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, enjoy being here with all of you this afternoon. Um, I've been living in the Salish Sea area for 21 years now. I'm originally Seneca from the Tondawana Seneca, Seneca Nation Territory. So that's kind of over there near where Nicole is joining us from in Geneseo, New York. Um, no Geneseo well did some research there back in the early 90s when I directed a cultural retention program that I developed, founded and directed in Tonawanda. Um, in having been here for 21 years, I currently work with the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Uh, I, serve, I serve as a program manager for our Northwest Heritage Program Artists in Residencies. I've been doing that for seven years. Uh, and in those seven years, I've done about 21 different culturally based artists and residence, residencies throughout originally what was Washington and Oregon. And then uh, in the last grant cycle year, uh, we included Idaho and Montana. Um, a lot of those artists and residencies are culturally based. And so I partner with, uh, with whatever entity uh, within that cultural community uh, to develop those artists and residencies based on what that community's interest is. Um, I'm also a, a, a contemporary artist, multimedia. Um, so. I uh, basically like to say I live a life of art and the art of life. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you, Lindley. How about Steve? We'll go with you next. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's great to be here this afternoon. Uh, I've been in the uh, construction business now, I hate to say it, 40 years. And, and uh, I, I uh, graduated, I'm an undergraduate from the University of Washington Architecture Program. And decide shortly thereafter that I'd rather be build, building than designing work. And so I, I spent uh, my first 10 years in the, doing a lot of public works for a very large contractor and then took some time to travel around the world with my wife for about a year and came back and rethought what I wanted to do with my construction career and wound up at the Raffin Company who, um, as it happens, is a specialist in historic preservation seismic retrofit work. And I never, that wasn't the reason that I went to work there, but uh, shortly thereafter, I was assigned a, a project. It was the Coliseum Theater renovation, which is now Banana Republic, downtown Seattle, and, and, and uh, worked on that project and really enjoyed it. And they said, well, Steve, you're really good at this. Um, we'll have some more work in the, uh, the next project, I think was the Cadillac Hotel, which was one of the more iconic projects in, in downtown Seattle that was badly damaged in the Nisqually earthquake. And it just rolled from there. So I say I'm something of an accidental preservationist because I just fell into it and, and uh, realized that I really enjoy the work and the people and, and uh, there's a lot of passionate people involved with historic preservation work. So as a project manager, uh, Steve, what kind of, what kind of is your day-to-day -day work in addition to obviously being interested in the projects themselves? I mean, are you on the phone a lot? Or are you walking out on the job site? What's your day-to-day? -day? So uh, my role, I guess now is uh, project executive is a lot of business development. And so my, my niche specialty is bringing in work that's historic preservation oriented. And you know, we continue to be very successful with that, you know, with at least all three or four projects kind of on the books for pre-construction and then rolling into the construction phase. So I do uh, the business development side and then do a, a lot of estimating. Um, which is part of the pre-construction process because there, there isn't a project if you can't come to a price that works for an owner of a building. So okay. that's, that's one of my main tasks. Great. All right, Sarah, what, uh, give us a quick uh, summary of your job responsibilities and okay. what's your uh, name? I think, like? Steve, I think all of us are, or a lot of us are accidental preservation. <laughs> I'll kind of stumble into the room. Um, so I am the landmarks coordinator for King County. So uh, I've been in Washington for about eight years, but I've been with King County for about two. And what I do is anything related to a landmark in both unincorporated King County and in the cities with which we have interlocal agreements. So we currently have interlocal agreements with 23 cities. 
So we function as basically their historic preservation planners. So any, any projects that happen on a landmark, um, any, any sort of renovations, any changes, um, I work with the owners both on a technical level and on a process permitting level uh, to get those through the Landmarks Commission and get approved. Um, I also develop landmark nominations um, pretty frequently now because we're all home, so it's an easy place to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and I work with like special valuation, which is our, local, our, our state historic preservation tax credit program and other federal tax credit programs. And then various grant projects. I coordinate with Four Culture, uh, which is an arts and heritage funding arm of King County, um, and with Washington Trust with their grant programs, and, and make sure that all the work is uh, in benefit or in service of preservation on historic landmarks. Um, and I do a little bit of planning stuff too. We, we do have a planner, and I occasionally help him in various projects like SEPA and 106 or anything that would need a little bit of extra consulting. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Well, the first question, besides the intro, um, Steve already answered a little bit about <clears throat> different positions that you all have held that have led to your current career. And, and Sarah sort of alluded to also being an accidental preservationist. I know you've got a wide range of experience in your background. So what other jobs have you held and kind of tell us a little bit about how you came to, to your current position and what other work you've done uh, in preservation? Okay. Um so I, I got my bachelor's in history and I kind of ran around and did a lot of old things for a while. And then I moved to New York. I got my first uh, preservation gig at a place in Metuchen, New Jersey. And then I worked for the Granite Village nonprofit for a while. So I found preservation in New York, but I ended up coming back to, uh, to get a graduate degree at the University of Oregon. And while I was there, I really wanted to concentrate because the school was heavy on policy, like policy planning uh, they were great, but I really wanted to have much more of a material construction arm, not just the planning part and not just the architectural design, but I want to understand materials better. So I ended up working, taking interesting jobs in grad school, uh, among them working at a contractor desk in a local lumber, com like lumber company. Um, I also, one of the best things I did was, was with the NICB, which is the National Council for Preservation Education. It's set up to, to place people in the national parks so I ended up working at Yosemite for a couple summers. Um, I did a little policy and planning there, but it was mostly on there with their preservation field crews. So we got to go to the most gorgeous places, back country and front country, and actually work on buildings and learn practices uh, just through mentorship. So I highly recommend looking into those programs. Um, unfortunately, I graduated from, I got my grad degree in 2010, which was the height of the Great Recession. And so every, I had a ton of interviews and every single time I heard, oh, you're great but we just hired someone who has 10 years more experience than me. So um, I just, I concentrated on finding things that I knew would have transferable skills because I knew that eventually things would recover. So uh, I became a project manager in a small construction company for a while because I know both the project management and the construction would be transferable. I did an AmeriCorps internship kind of thing out in, in state parks in Oregon, Eastern Oregon. And then I finally became a ranger for Washington State Parks, but I focused on their historic their historical parks, which is like Fort Casey up on Whidbey Island. So they would put me, because they had this free educated preservationist. Well, I wasn't free, but they weren't paying for that part. Um, so they'd put me to work on, on doing preservation work on the on site in addition to other ranger duties. So I just found ways to make, make it work until I finally landed a position, an actual preservation position at EB's Landing National Historical Reserve, which I was at for five years. Um, and I got to do a really broad range from everything from running a field school to working with all the, the county and, and city planners there. Like it's, I just got to do a whole wide range of things. And so that that's really helped. Like having the breadth of, of experience has really helped move my career along well. Awesome. Lindley, did you, I don't think you gave a, a background exactly of how you managed uh, to you gave them a little bit of a background of kind of your geographic history, but what about a little bit more about your professional history? That's an interesting story. And if you were to ask my mother the same question, she would say, I live a charmed life. <laughs> so I, was, I, I actually went to school uh, at the Rochester Institute of Technology for industrial design. And then I moved back to Tonawanda 
Um, and at that point in time, there wasn't really a whole lot going on economically in regards to that community uh, for job or employment opportunities. So this was pre-gas station, pre-cigarette uh, economy. So really there was nothing there on the a reservation or on our nation territory. Um, and a friend of uh, mine who was a cousin who lived in Tonawanda was on a board for a museum called the Skahari Museum of the Iroquois. And he encouraged me to apply for their first one year internship, which was funded by the New York State Council of the Arts. And of course I did, and of course I was awarded that. So I ended up there. Um, I attended the Institute of American Indian Arts and a friend of mine who was my printmaking instructor while I was there was then working for the, um, uh, it was an arts organization in Washington, DC. I, I, I forget the name of it. Um, and his job was to read the museum newsletters that came out. And he saw that I was an intern, got in touch with me, encouraged me to apply to the Smithsonian for a um, internship, um, basically walked me through the process so I'd have the best application uh, possible. Um, I did that, I was awarded that, but at the same time, my sister was doing an intern for the public relations office at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, the National Museum of the American Indian had just been developed in regards to the American Indian Museum collection being given to the Smithsonian to create the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, there was an ad hoc committee that was put together of Smithsonian Native American employees uh, because that initial a list of nominations to the board for the NMAI only included three native folks. And so the ad hoc committee of native employees for the Smithsonian um, were asserting that at least 50% of those board members for the NMAI needed to be native American. Um, I ended up uh, getting a job with the uh, center for, or at that point in time, it was folk life. So I worked on the Festival of American Folklife for three summers. It was the quincentenary years, which is why I decided to stick around because they were rich with cash at that point in time. Um, I drafted up uh, pro program structures, which were facades, and then became a tech crew leader to then build those program structures. Um, I eventually ended up at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, and while being there, uh, they were developed the folk life. We were working with folk life to develop another program for, I believe it was 1992. Um, and I believe the program was called Native America or uh, Social Dance in the Americas. Um, and I presented a program on uh, Hadina Shoni Social Dance. Um, and like I said, I, I never pursued any of these opportunities, they just fell into my lap. But with uh, presenting that program for the Smithsonian. Uh, the Smithsonian actually won an award for that uh, social dance in the Americas program during that folk life festival. And that just opened up doors. So I ended up being asked to serve as a consultant to NEPAD at that point in time, which, which was funded by Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, NEPAD was National Initiative to Preserve American Dance. Um, next thing you know, they encouraged me to apply for a grant, which I did. Um, and it was awarded. Um, and with that grant, I started what I called the cultural retention program in Tonawanda. Um, and by that point in time, I had moved back to my home community. Um, so all of the opportunities that have fallen into my lap literally are opportunities that I didn't pursue. Somebody just came and said, hey, you should consider this. Um, so in a roundabout way, I ended up with the law here in Washington state. Um, I ended up at the Longhouse and serving on their advisory board for seven years before they asked me to step down off of this advisory board. Um, but everything that has fallen into my lap has fallen into, into my lap because of my culturally based knowledge growing up in Tonawanda in a traditional Longhouse community and extended family. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's interesting that both Sarah and Lindley mentioned having to deal with a low economic period in their careers because I think that's a lot that's an issue that a lot of young professionals and potentially graduating students in the in the near future are going to have to deal with for the next few years. Steve did you have any kind of periods of economic uncertainty in your career and maybe how did you deal with that? Well when I graduated in 1980 that was also a, a terrible recession. Uh, you couldn't uh, arc architects were ha having a very difficult time getting any jobs. My, I did intern for an architect uh, for summer and I was earning $2.75 an hour and re really questioned uh, the purpose of, of 
remaining in that field. And, and then I had a good professor that suggested, well, you ought to check out construction because it probably pays better than architecture. <laughs> and so I changed and, and never looked back. That's great, yeah. Well, the next couple of questions are kind of dual related. Um, we want to talk a little bit about, and, and some of you have touched on this already, about the skills and experiences that you have found most useful for yourself personally in your career and kind of how that's helped you along, um, but also what you think a potential employer in your field would be looking for. And maybe those line up and maybe, maybe there are some differences um, in, in what you see and what an, an employer might see. So why don't we bounce over to Sarah? Um, you touch, touched on this a little bit, but um, what kinds of skills and things did you feel like you were maintaining when you were you know, doing your project management and different things? How did, that, how did you relate that to future potential preservation work uh, to keep yourself ready for a job? I think you're on mute, Sarah. Uh, construction and structures that, and materials involved, that's, a, that's just pretty directly relatable. Um, I, I was surprised to learn that a lot of people in my class and a lot of people in the policy, they, they tend to be segregated. So you're either dealing with architects, planners, or in the trades people. And there weren't a lot of people that, that crossed those boundaries. And so I really wanted to try to make myself as diverse as I could. And so I really focused on that, the construction angle through that, through the construction company. I thought that was directly relatable, plus project management sales. So if you're doing that, that's good. Um, if it depends on wh whatever you're interested, in, try to find all the paths into that thing. So anything that's kind of related, let's say you're really interested in vernacular landscapes, like learn each part of whatever is involved in that and then just kind of branch out and explore it like and get involved with organizations that do that and um, and that just kind of make yourself known and, and explore the breadth of, of whatever is involved that would be probably be my recommendation uh, and learn GIS which is the one thing I didn't do and everyone should do that's a very direct I think yeah. very useful suggestion in the preservation <laughs> field these days what what kind of organizations um, do you well in addition to excellent organizations like the Washington Trust. Mm -hmm. um, what other types of maybe volunteer opportunities do you feel uh, could be useful for people looking to get involved professionally? Um, I like places like APT, the uh, Applied Preservation Technology, or uh, NCPTT, which is the National Council for Technology and Training. They actually have some great trainings and they go all over the, the nation. Um, and, and that could be anything from learning about uh, masonry in the Southwest to uh, Section 106 planning. So they really cover a lot. And that, now they're doing, speaking of GIS, they're doing cultural GIS training. So you're, you're taking the whole idea of mapping, but you're applying it to cultural resources and that can have a really different view. So really kind of a little bit more specialized, but just tailor it to what, what you're interested in and those should cover it. So if you can, there's always going to be organizations related to whatever it is you're interested in. Um, and the best thing to do is just get really get involved as much as you can with them. Yeah, and do any of those organizations offer, we got a question in the question box about certificate programs. Are, are any of those programs kind of sequential and have some sort of professional training certificate or is that more just- Not that I've seen. I mean, I think you get, they might have AA credits or they might have other things like that, but I haven't seen a certificate through NCPTT or other places like that. But that's not to say um, there are other places like Clats of Community College that, that do do certificates um, in various places, so you can find them pretty easily. Yep. Yep. And I know the University of Washington has a certificate for preservation. Plant, well, it's kind of general preservation. It's actually the program that I went through. So, um, so yes, Steve, why don't, um, what kind of organizations are kind of on the more built side? Are there membership organizations or um, kind of volunteer organizations or, or education uh, training for the construction industry that you could uh, recommend that people check out? Oh, absolutely. There's, well, there's so much opportunity within the construction industry to, to work on uh, pres preservation type projects. And, and we haven't talked 
enough about the trades and there's there, there's a, a lot of opportunity in trades there's there's apprenticeship programs um, there's you know union and non-union apprenticeship programs and there's so many specialty subs involved with historic preservation uh, masonry for instance um, and you know plastering and 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 carpentry you know we need good Good carpenters and and every seismic retrofit historic preservation involves multiple trades and and you know I've worked with steel erectors who are just absolutely enthusiastic about preservation and working you know fixing up a really cool old building and so there's opportunities with lots of firms to um, you know come up through the trades. And a lot of the, the management in these firms and in also general contracting firms have also come up through the trades as well. And, and I guess I'd really emphasize that's a, a good way to become a part of the preservation community. I, I think one also needs to look at the firms. You know, if you, if you go to a trade, um, if you go through a trade training program, you can look at specific uh, specializing subcontractors that really focus on historic preservation. I, you know, I think of like there's a number of firms here in the Seattle area that specialize in in uh, repair and restoration of wood windows. And so, you know, if that if that's an interest of somebody in the, the carpentry trade, there's opportunity there. Uh, Mention masons again. There's a, a national shortage of plasters that know how to recreate ornamental pl plaster or repair ornamental plaster. And then, of course, you know, on the on the general contracting side, uh, we have. Um, people with architecture backgrounds, structural engineering backgrounds, history backgrounds even, that are all um, working in the uh, work at Raffin in, in particular. It's, so it's kind of a, 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 people kind of find their paths to where they need to go. And, and, and so I would, if people are interested in that, I wouldn't say having, if you, you don't have a construction or design related degree, you could look at certificate programs like at the University of Washington, uh, for instance. But mainly, it, you know, we're, we're looking for people that are creative problem solvers and, and people that are willing to learn. And Steve, would you say that in, in your industry that apprenticeships or maybe in the, the specific trades of the, that you work with and on each project, you're seeing multiple trades per project. Would you say that kind of that training is really only available through apprenticeships and kind of just getting your hands dirty and, and learning on the job? It's, uh, we definitely encourage people to go through apprenticeship training because you can only go so far. Sure. and. And the 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 trade the trades are are there's there's a there's a lot to, there's a lot to know to be a, a a qualified mason or a qualified carpenter or electrician a plumber um, all very important uh, skills to have. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So Lindley, your your um, career path has been a little bit more, I think art and interpretation, um, what kind of skills do you feel like have been the most valuable to you on, on that side of things um, and, and potentially the types of employers that you've worked with, what they might find valuable as well? The skills that contributed to my successes and where I've ended up career-wise really are fundamental to my growth um, in uh, having grown up in a traditional longhouse community in Tonawanda. Um, my extended family and my extended clan family have generationally been a nucleus to that longhouse's fire. And so having grown up in that environment and really being able to articulate a cultural perspective has been the strength that has gotten me here today where I am, regardless of whether I'm talking about traditional culture or whether I'm talking about contemporary Native American art. Um, and so uh, my transition from 
the Iroquois Indian Museum to the uh, Festival of American Folklife um, for the Office of Folklife Programs and Cultural Studies for the Smithsonian to the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian where I presented a lot of our public programs um, and specifically the public programs for the George Gustav High Center in 1992 before the George Gustav High Center of the National Museum of the American Indian was open. Um, that facility was actually opened in 1994 to the public. And at that point in time, I had moved back to Tonawanda, but I was brought back into NMAI and the Smithsonian as a contractor to again, present those um, public programs for the grand opening of the George Gustav High Center. Um, but my visibility at the uh, National Museum of the American Indian, um, because I was inside the Beltway, because I was within the Smithsonian, that really opened up doors. Um, so for instance, my association with the National Initiative to Preserve American Dance, but also a lot of those folks um, were working together in the cultural arts fields, like the National Council and the NEA's um, tra traditional arts programs uh, through the National Heritage Awards. Oftentimes, those folks would all work together to contract with other folks um, because they needed to hire somebody for two weeks or something along those lines, just short period contracts. Um, and so I was very fortunate that I um, got on the radar for the, uh, the uh, NEA and ended up reading uh, three uh, grant panels over a 15 year time period. Um, so a lot of it was just visibility and my being able to present um, a cultural perspective and articulate it very well. Um, so for instance, I remember at one point in time, we were at the George Gustav High Center and we were doing uh, a program that was titled something along the lines of celebrating Native American dance. Um, and we were doing 12 weekends of public programs and I was uh, presenting those public programs and we were doing a radio program with Native America Calling. And the host at that point in time, his name was Tom Beaver. And the very first question he asked was, why as Native Americans are you celebrating Native American dance? And I was just a contractor, but I was presenting the public programs and the staff who were on the call who were Native couldn't answer the question why do Native Americans celebrate Native American dance? And with my upbringing and my background, having grown up in a longhouse, having grown up uh, singing and dancing uh, to our social dances, our so social dances, our ceremonial dances and our medicine society dances, I was able to respond to that question articulately. Um, and what was interesting is after the phone call was over the other staff from NMAI, we were in separate offices because there weren't enough phones in one office for all of us to join in on the call. So when the call was over, it was interesting because they all came running out to the office where I was and they were like, you saved us, oh my God, that was great, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, cultural perspective has been my strength and my asset. That's really interesting. Thank you, Lindley. That's definitely, um, I think, can be applied in in a lot of different areas of preservation, just um, in across different cultures, across different um, time time frames and, and and specialties. So, I do. We do have kind of a wrap up question um, for the for the planned part. So, again, if any of the audience members have any questions that have sparked. Um, spark their interest, please go ahead and put those in the question box. If not, of course, we'll, we'll come up with something to talk about. <laughs> so, um, but the last kind of planned question we had, we've talked a little bit about organizations people can in get involved with, but I wanted to also ask more specifically if there are other resources that, that you all would recommend, whether it's um, books or articles or job sites or websites or any type of specific resource that you know when someone comes to you and asks how do I get involved in your um, career path you say you know look at this go here um, some of those really specific um, comments that like I said um, some of you've already touched on but if you, there's any that um, have come to mind um, in addition we'd love to hear them we'll start with Sarah um, generally, I mean, there's ones like the Preservation Directory that's kind of a, a clearinghouse for everything preservation related nationally. Um, in terms of just, you know, whatever organizations happen to be serving your state or locality. Um, I'm, in terms of books and other things like that, I would actually recommend, and this might sound a little odd, but there's a real push in preservation toward elements of cultural landscape. And, and it's 
beginning to really morph. So I would, there's a couple of really amazing books about cultural landscape and then other books about identity and how race plays into preservation and, and kind of um, some of the more recent and current conversations happening in the field. And those are really useful to just keep yourself up with because when you walk into a room and you can actually start talking about what everyone else is talking about, it, it, it helps to cement those connections. It's a little bit like what Lily was talking about. Um, having a, a depth of knowledge about whatever it is you're trying to actually achieve. Um, so it's really just basic research, um, really targeted on what, wherever you want to be and what exactly you want to be doing. And I want to make one other point to Steve's point earlier um, about apprenticeships and getting work. And I, one of the things I discovered in New York was people are a lot more accessible than you think they are. So uh, I actually got two jobs just by cold calling the companies. I would research them and I'd call them and say, hey, what do you guys have? And they would tell me that I was hired and it was great. Um, but it's people, they can do inter informational interviews. You can find volunteer positions or you can just start researching companies and call them. It, it's actually a lot more, it's a lot more uncomfortable. It's horrible, I hate doing it, but it's a lot more effective than trying to use the same paths everyone else is using. And online is probably the, what the least, one of the least successful ways to find a job. You have to get out and talk to people as best you can. So I just wanted to bring that up, but don't be afraid to call um, and so find ways to get involved with people that way. Um, well, there, Sarah, oh. we did have someone ask, you had mentioned um, some books. Did you have any specific titles uh, or just? Uh, there's one, there's Cultural Landscapes by Richard Longstreth. That's probably the newest one. Uh, there was. There's one that I just ordered yesterday. It's called Race Place. I'll have to look up the title for that, or maybe Alex, you can. It's it's one that was just Ned Kaufman wrote that one. I just can't remember the exact title. Um, and that's a huge discussion right now about how we frame the stories that we're framing and who's doing the framing um, and how to just really broaden preservation as a whole. And so if you have a little bit of interest in, in looking at that and looking more at the philosophy behind it, um, you're going to have a, you're going to have more dynamic conversations with the people you're interacting with. So. And just, yeah, to follow up on that, I know you're saying like, you know, obviously calling people, cold calling can be a little awkward, but if you have some talking points from like a book that you read that you have thoughts about or an article you can send, I've always personally found that to be like a very helpful conversation starter. It's good at parties too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll do one more for cold calling and getting a job out of it. So um, yeah, that definitely works. I mean, if if you're willing to do a little bit of volunteering, maybe a little bit of interning um, and kind of get involved, uh, that can go a long way. Um, Steve and Lindley, did, did either of you have any more specific suggestions about books and articles or other, any other very specific materials? Um, for people to look at if, if not of course we can we can move on but just want to give you both a chance to answer go ahead steve oh okay uh one of the you know like i was saying before i kind of fell into preservation it was kind of learning on on the the job but i've spent a lot of time reading uh secretary of interior standards for preservation you know there's lots of publications there as well as the national trust for historic preservation has a, a lot of information and you know i've studied up on you know how tax credits work over the years and and as, so no no really specific books i would say you know if people are interested in in the construction management side and they're coming from maybe not a, a const construction related area uh, the uh, certificate program at the University of Washington is is really good and and we've had a number of people complete that program uh, but uh, what one other thing I want to, to note is that there's a lot of a lot of opportunities in the trades both you know doing the work and managing the work and I've I've known people that have said, well, I want to do historic preservation related work 24-7. And I tell them that 
well, you know, you'll be really lucky if you're working on maybe half of the jobs you do in your career are, are historic preservation related. You have to take, if you're in the construction business, you're going to be doing a variety of work. And, and what you can do, though, is seek out those companies that have an emphasis on, on historic preservation work. But still, you have to realize that that it's, that's not what you can be doing 100% of the time. I've managed to parlay my career into a place where that's what I'm doing all the time. Is probably you know ninety percent of what I do, but I've found there's not too many people like myself that have been able to do that. Well, and you, as you said earlier, you're you've had you've had forty years to go to do that and to get to that uh, position. I mean, even working for a preservation nonprofit like myself, there's a lot of other work that we all do, whether it's event planning or um, website stuff or um, or grant management, you know, that that may not that may be related, but is not specifically, you know, always going out and touring a building. It's some there's paperwork and other things that that we all do. So um, so yeah, no, I appreciate that comment, Steve, because I think that that's that's definitely true. So actually on that note, we did get a question from the audience about any uh, funding to help supplement um, salary that one would get as an apprentice, or if you're doing like smaller contract work. Lindley, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, you've kind of like jumped between a few different contract positions, like what kind of funding opportunities or, you know, second jobs have people held to kind of help make that work financially? Um, and Lindley, I'm going to put you on the spot. I think you're muted. One second, I'll unmute you. I got it. Um, <laughs> I'd like to contribute to that last response in regards to resources out there that are available. I mean, uh, this kind of uh, flows into uh, the recent question that you've just asked, but um, at the Evergreen State Longhouse, Longhouse Education and Cultural Center, um, with a lot of the artisan residencies that we've supported, um, we've also supported artisan residencies that are mentorship apprentice opportunity. So for instance, right now, Greg Colfax is down um, refurbishing the Longhouse Thunderbird. And Greg Colfax was one of the original carvers. He's Macaw from Nia Bay who carved that Thunderbird. And so we're uh, teaming Greg up with a handful of younger uh, artists from uh, the South Puget Sound Salish Sea area um, to help them to develop their carving skills so they can contribute to the field in strengthening the cultural arts. Um, and so the term that I use uh, is retention or breathing life back into our cultural arts because they're living cultural arts as opposed to preservation. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about in regards to resources available and what books I could recommend, the thing that I would recommend is I would recommend somebody like us at the Longhouse or somebody um, like the National Museum of the American Indian supporting the publication of a indigenous boat building resource book. Um, we've been very fortunate at the Longhouse that we've supported a number of boat builders or carvers who are reviving, breathing life back into and retaining those traditions, which were pretty much almost not necessarily visible or available or engaged. So for instance, we supported a young man who's a uh, Spokane tribe, um, who uh, has got his PhD in indigenous architecture and utilized that PhD background to revive um, and strengthen the sturgeon nose canoe traditions by framing and skinning sturgeon nose, nose canoes, which are very specific to that Northwest part of Washington and British Columbia. Um, but at the Longhouse, we've also been fortunate enough to support um, Salish canoe carvers doing dugout canoes for the oceans, for tribal canoe journeys for tribes. Um, and right now there's a huge revival of dugout canoes, wooden dugout canoes on the Upper Columbia River through the Upper Columbia River tribes. Um, we've also supported uh, a uh, Inupiat young man who built a, um, I forget the name of the skin canoe uh, that, that they use up there in that area. So we're fortunate that we've worked with a handful of uh, indigenous carvers to revive their water voyaging, uh, ocean navigating 
traditions. And we're fortunate that we've also worked with Kanaka Maoli from Hawaii, and we've also worked with Maori from New Zealand in regards to kind of bringing those, what we refer to as voyages of creativity together. So I think that would be a great opportunity for um, uh, a, a resource publication. Um, but for me, my position at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center uh, is something that helps to sustain uh, what I say is my living at art of life in the life of art as a full-time artist with a part-time job. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I think we had one other question in the Q&A. I don't, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Oh, sure, please. I can't think of anyone, any grants or anything available just for a person to try to make a living, but um, there are things like AmeriCorps and when you're working for AmeriCorps, they, they suspend your loans and they do make a payment toward it. So depending on where you are in your career, you could do AmeriCorps. There's also Hope Crew and there's other kind of preservation, especially if you're interested in the hands-on work. There's a number of um, national organizations like Hope and AmeriCorps that do training and they have different incentives built into them to try to help people do this. But it's if you're already doing something else, um, it'd be hard to put those together, but just as there's options for possible outside the, the norm training programs, they would both be qualifying. Yeah, and you also mentioned that as a bit of a, of a, a help between opportunities for yourself um, yeah. with the, <laughs> the economic issues. Um, we have one question from, uh, John Nell, who is a commissioner in Walla Walla, and she, a uh, uh, historic preservation commissioner, um, and she was wanting to know how you all would recommend um, building out partnerships with people in the trades as maybe just a community member and, and wanting to learn more. Um, so maybe Sarah, as, as the Landmarks Coordinator for King County, is there a way for the public or other um, folks to, to learn more about trades generally, whether it's a commissioner or um, pub public folks just wanting, wanting, you know, not maybe wanting to get involved in all the professional organizations, but just have some general knowledge? Actually, yeah, we, we were planning on hosting a window workshop this summer, uh, if COVID hadn't happened, we would be, and I love those. They're just a way to get community members in, like three days of fixing historic windows on a historic building led by trainers who know what they're doing. And so, and you can find field schools, really formal ones through various universities. I know the my alma mater U of O has a pretty uh, well-known Pacific Northwest field school. Um, and so just to do little training programs, you can do that in archeology, span just summer field schools in various places. And you can find, either free community-based ones, you know, organizations like King County will do, or you can pay a couple hundred dollars to go do, or, you know, sometimes in the water to do something through a school. So there are opportunities like that um, around. You just kind of have to, it's, the trick is to find out about them because we all try to advertise. It's funny how hard we try to get the word out and how hard people try to find us and we still have trouble <laughs> like matching up. But um, so yeah, just do a little digging and you should be able to find things like that. Yeah, we'll have to try to, if I, as a statewide, maybe we should uh, try to try to get some of those things advertised uh, across the state. I know, you know, there's um, different woodworking schools too, like in Port Townsend, and someone mentioned earlier Clats Up, which um, have sort of varying degrees of formal teaching, but I think also do uh, public public outreach as well. So we've got another question in the box talking about online slash distance slash work from home uh, opportunities right now, which obviously in hands-on trades, maybe not as applicable, but do any of you have any thoughts on how someone right now could maybe start getting involved or if any of those opportunities uh, exist that you know of? I guess maybe I'll throw it to Steve. <laughs> I, I was afraid of that. <laughs> if there's, I mean, if there's not really, I mean, and there's not really a substitute for being on a construction site. Um, so if there's not an, if there's not an option. There, there, re there really isn't. And, and so, you know, we, we have employees obviously that are building work right now. And, and there's a very few of us that have the luxury of, of being able to work from home a lot. And that's, mostly those of us involved with pre-construction and business development. 
Lindley or Sarah, any other any thoughts on that, or is it just a little bit hard to do unless you're kind of already established and kind of have tasks that you can keep working on from from home? Yeah, I would, I would say that's. I mean, you can do you can always do research. You can always learn about structures, learn about materials, do random experiments in your living room. But I don't know. <laughs> um, I can't think of anything that would help with that. Is the stay at home bit of a tough time. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, Lindley? Sure, I have some thoughts. I wouldn't necessarily say online opportunities that are long-term um, employment opportunities in regards to increasing or, or um, uh, contributing to somebody's salary. Um, but one of the things that on a number of the native arts organizations throughout the country are doing, like us at the Longhorns, through, um, through our artist and residency grant programs, um, and like the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation down in Vancouver, Washington, and the First Peoples Fund in uh, uh, the, the South Dakota area, Rapid City in Rapid City, uh, of, although three of those organizations have taken their grant programs or their fellowship opportunities and really uh, pivoted to focus those um, cash awards towards artists' grant relief and those artists developing videos uh, that are sharing a uh, cultural arts workshop type of experience. Um, but there's also fellowship opportunities from each of those organizations that allow an artist to either do uh, mentorship or apprenticing. Um, and I've seen a number of Native artists uh, from throughout the country benefit from those opportunities, including Native Hawaiians through Native Arts and Cultures Foundation um, and us at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center. Um, so as a Native artist right now, um, it's a really, it has been a really good time in regards to support from arts organizations for those artists to be able to kind of springboard and, and, and launch their careers and their artistic paths successfully. Actually, Lindley, on that note, um, and I know we only have time for one more question, but I'm curious because you have, as an artist, are hands-on with cultural resources in a kind of different way. And I'm wondering, how do you think that your perspective as an artist influences the way that you do public programming and interpretation? Did you repeat that last part? You broke up enough that I did. Sure, sorry. Um, I asked, how do you think that your perspective as an artist influences your um, programming and interpretation work? You know, that's an interesting question because I'm very fortunate that uh, through the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center, I've been very involved in international indigenous visual arts gatherings. And those international indigenous visual arts gatherings initially were started by Toy Maori, which is a Maori arts organization, kind of like the NEA is to the arts here in the United States. But Toy Maori is specific to all of the Maori arts um, and disciplines within New Zealand. And they started these international indigenous visual arts gatherings. And there were a number of artists from the Pacific Northwest who were invited to attend um, back in say 1995 or so, it might've been even earlier. And one of them came back to the Longhouse and asked the Longhouse to consider hosting an international indigenous visual arts gathering, which the Longhouse did in 2001, which was recall, referred to as Return to the Swing. Um, we also hosted at the Longhouse a second international indigenous visual arts gathering in 2017, which was part of our 20th year anniversary. And so what has uh, really resulted for me in regards to my artistic growth in being able to articulate a cultural perspective is working with those other indigenous arts organizations. Um, and really the precursor to that was I was reading grants for National Geographic. It was an all roads uh, film program specifically for cultural artists making films about their cultural communities. Um, and in reading those grants for two years, um, I realized that there was a lot more culturally that we all shared in a value of perspective than there were differences in, the, in things separating us by value. Um, so it's really being um, exposed to a broader range uh, and depth of culture in regards to how you incorporate and utilize that interpretation into um, moving forward creatively as, as, as a human race. Thank you, Lindley. That's that's a really good note, I think, to end on um, since we're getting right up to one o'clock. Um, there was one more question uh, from 
folks at uh, SUNY in New York that they are planning to start a trades program at their university and they were they were wondering about um, essential topics they should include so maybe we'll 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 shift that to a, maybe a written suggestion from our panelists and and send that out to to everyone who's attending um, today just so you can you can see all their perspectives and I am going to go ahead and share the um, contact information of our panelists one last time if anyone wanted to follow up specifically with um, other questions or or um, something more specific to your situation or or, or ideas um, and I want to thank all of our panelists again for joining us. I think it's you both, all three offered very different perspectives on uh, the trades um, and how they relate to preservation and how um, art and culture combine and, and are not that different. So I really appreciate all three of your perspectives. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and sign off now, unless any of the panelists had any last uh, comments they wanted to, to put out there. Nope. All right, well, I think we'll follow up the email with the answer to the last question and a bunch of links to everything that were, was discussed today, some books and websites and organizations and everything. Um, so people can have that at their, at their fingertips. And of course, feel free to follow up with me or Alex at the Washington Trust with any other questions. Um, and we really appreciate everyone who's been on the call today and especially our, our panelists for, for sharing a little bit about their lives and careers with us. And we'll see y'all later. Zoom, zoom. Thank everyone Thank for joining us. Everyone. <laughs>